It is October 25th, 2020. Welcome to our First Southern Baptist Church virtual worship. Let's prepare our heart for our Sunday worship. The call to worship scripture is from the book of Psalm 122, verse 1. It says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let's begin our worship service. Well, again, we want to welcome all of you to our service. Uh, unfortunately, today, uh, October 25th, we had planned to meet outside, uh, but unfortunately, due to the rain, uh, we felt we need to do this service again, uh, virtually. So as we begin, I, I wanna welcome all of you again and I pray that uh, everyone's uh, doing well. So as we start, I, I wanna read uh, a devotional thought uh, that will actually hopefully remind you about uh, our, our presence uh, and our relationship with uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. But also after that, I will lead in a prayer right after the devotional thought. So it's entitled, Jesus Prays For You. It says here, prayer is not best left only to private moments. When you're recovering from surgery in a hospital, to have a friend pray for, your, for you at your bedside is comforting. After a loved one's passing, we need to hear the prayers of our family, our friends, and fellow church members so we do not feel alone in our grief. To have people share with you that they've prayed about your need is such a good thing to hear. It's powerful when someone prays out loud for you so you can hear their cry to God on your behalf. Just before his arrest, Jesus prayed for himself, the disciples, and all of us who would follow him. The prayer offered by Jesus teaches us who we are and how clear or how dear we are to Christ. In this hour of betrayal and execution, Jesus prayed for us. Jesus' prayer teaches that eternal life is more about relationships than a timeline. His intercession is for our purity and continued fellowship with God. It is hard to describe one's emotions when they understand that the Savior has prayed for them. May we allow Jesus', Jesus priorities in prayer to guide our own prayer lives. And it says here, Father, thank you for the great care shown to me by Jesus' loving intercession for my protection. And the key verse for this is from John 17, 9. It says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we thank you for the wonderful privilege that we can gather together as a church family, whether it's uh, in-house worship or virtually, we pray that the words uh, that we pray about and the fact that we're all connected to you one way or the other, 
And Lord, I pray this time for our country. I pray for the situation concerning the pandemic. I pray for your intervention in bringing about a solution to the problems that we face. And Lord, we know that this is a very serious matter, but maybe it's a lesson for us to draw closer to you as we go through this period of uh, uncertainty and, and uh, the number of people that are, have lost their lives and also we pray for the people that uh, the doctors, the first responders, and all the people that are ministering to these people that have been affected by the virus. But Lord, we also pray that uh, we to ourselves can be responsible in helping to uh, the issue about the virus of the spread. And I pray that you'll just guide each one of us to take this as a matter of uh, great responsibility to bring about healing also. Lord, I pray for our missionaries and I pray for the work that they're doing away from us. Oftentimes during these days, we tend to forget about uh, the work that's going on uh, to bring about people to come to know you personally. So Lord, we pray for each one of them, wherever they may be, in foreign lands or even here at home and lord we pray that we can do our part in uh, ministering and sharing uh, the ministry with each one of them and lord i pray that as we uh, uh, seek to be more diligent in uh, our spiritual lives that we continue to seek your wisdom in helping to grow spiritually, that we can be ones that will listen to your words, that our lives will reflect the kind of character that you want us to be. So Lord, again, I pray that the, each of us might uh, uh, be in constant seeking of your wisdom in how we should live our lives. I pray too, Father, that uh, our nation, as we are continuing to approach the days of uh, the voting and the selection of <clears throat> leaders in our country. I pray, Father, that your hand will be involved in all of this, that we might be able to select the one that you have selected for us to lead the nation, but also in our local elections, our Congress. I pray that you'll just uh, be involved in selecting the right people that can bring about peace and the uh, health of our country back together again. I pray for people that uh, uh, against the uh, Constitution and the things that uh, we often cherish in our lives. I pray that you'll just bring about healing, but about peace and about comfort in all the people in this nation. And Father, I thank you again for all your blessings. We know that oftentimes we forget to thank you for what has been a blessing to each of us individually and as a nation. For we have much of that that you have given to us. So we pray that you'll accept our gifts of thanksgiving and love for all that you do for us. We thank you for all these blessings. For this I pray in your name. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it The name of God's redeeming love Hitherto Thy love has blessed me Thou hast drawn Wandering from the fold of God, 
To all of you. Uh, today for the California Mission Offering, again, I just want to repeat that our goal is $499,999. Our church so far has only collected $150, especially since we are not meeting. However, the needs of the people of California are great or even greater now. Uh, our offering is used only in California, and we planted 58 new churches last year, and we hope that this year we can do better. And we ha this offering also supports evangelism projects and disaster relief, especially now during the time when we had all these fires pandemics and sometimes floods and earthquakes the great the need is much much greater and we have actually 36 
disaster relief units, which includes kitchen trailers where they can cook and serve meals. They have recovery trailers where volunteers help victims with special needs after disasters, after disasters or during disasters. And they have shower trailers where people can take a shower when their homes have been destroyed or even for uh, firefighters that need a shower. <clears throat> and just incidentally, in 1994, when they had the great uh, Northridge earthquake, our convention was able to provide one million meals to the people in that area. And uh, sometimes uh, disaster occurs in other states like Katrina. Then we have sent some of our mobile units and California disaster teams to go and aid them. Small churches and association projects are also being supported by the CMO, such as uh, things that we needed for the uh, fall uh, harvest fest. They bought us, they bought association things to help us with on, and we can borrow them and use them at any time. Uh, and then one great ministry is the migrant ministries. Now remember these migrants uh, provide a lot of food for us because they harvest the food, uh, vegetables especially, and fruits for all of us. But they live in very, very uh, minimal structures. So we need to help them and we provide backpacks and things for the children, clothing, and even food for families that are in great need. And so, uh, and also the California Baptist University, we provide funds to help them for special things. And sometimes even uh, we provide medical doctors and dentists who volunteer their services and send them to places where there is a great need. So this is your chance to help with all these projects and to give back to the Lord in helping others. Thank you very much. Let me share with you some of the announcements and reminders that our church and our church family uh, would like to uh, consider. First of all, uh, next week, this Sunday, uh, November 1st, is the end of the daylight savings time so it will be necessary for you saturday night after midnight uh, you change your clock uh, one hour back so that you will be on time for all of your activities for the following day and the week and uh, next sunday of course if things are going well with the weather we will uh, have our, our worship service our outside worship service so just keep that in mind and of course if anything happens or changes uh, uh, we will let you know in advance uh, remember it's very important that the voting takes place this coming week uh, and i pray that uh, each of you will study the, uh, the the responsibilities of each candidate and who you feel might be leading our country our city our state in a very uh, a way that uh, we'll be more inclined to uh, uh, follow uh, the character of our, our Lord. Uh, we also want to remi remind you that we do have uh, our still our love gifts and tithes and offerings that we should continue to give even though we are not meeting uh, each week. I pray that uh, you'll consider that as a means because expenses do not stop. Uh, we need to continue to take care of all of those uh, various expenses. And again, I want to thank uh, Tim Soy and Helen Soy for helping us uh, with this uh, virtual uh, uh, ministry. I pray that uh, you folks will continue to 
support all the efforts that we are trying to make. Uh, we realize that as we go along, we want to improve, and uh, someday we hope that we can gather together in our church uh, house and we can have worship together. So again, thank you for your uh, continued prayers, and I pray that you'll just uh, uh, feel a need, if you want to, to share or to uh, participate in the service uh, each week. But thank you again. First Southern Baptist Church of Monterey Parks, good to see you. Good to be with you today. So, how are you doing? Well, I'm surviving. That's what the response I get a lot of times when I'm asking people. But these are tough times, and just how are you doing? You know, in times of pandemic and massive disruptions in creation and the social world around us, we're often lost what to say, even knowing, even really knowing what's the right thing to pray for. But I've got good news. God has graciously given His Spirit to help us in times just like these. We have a resource that the rest of the world lacks. And when we understand this and, and really get in step with the Spirit's ministry in the heart, we're going to find great joy. So we're going to continue our series about more than a survivor, overcoming, overpowering, and overjoyed. And today I want to talk about being overjoyed by the Spirit's work. And we're going to continue looking at this passage in Romans chapter 8. This is what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, we're going to take a little bit deeper look at this, but just at the first it says, in the same way. Now that links it to what's gone on before. In the passages right before this, it talks about all of creation groaning, and uh, we as God's creation also have this groaning, and but the Spirit's given us this down pain of knowing this hope we're going to have, and so the Spirit helps us in that groaning experience. And then in this passage, it says, in this very same way, and he delves in deeper into the Spirit's work in our heart in these times that we're kind of left speechless. Let's Let's dig a little deeper. So the Spirit helps us in the middle of our failings. He doesn't abandon us because of them. This passage talks about our weaknesses. Romans 8, 26 says, In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Now, I know I feel weak at times. I know you do too. And sometimes we get the idea, well, I just need to be stronger, and that way I'll please God, and I'll be, God will give me the help because I'm strong, like God helps the strong. Well, actually, it's the weak that need God's help, and God loves to help those who depend on Him. And so we're finding here in this passage, the Spirit comes in the middle of our weaknesses, in the middle of our failings. He doesn't abandon us because of them. Now, this is really good news. Now, our weaknesses cause us to lean entirely upon Christ, and then we find real strength. But until we get to that point where we're really honest with ourselves, I can't handle this, I am weak, I have to turn to God, I don't uh, depend on myself or all my other resources, I turn to God, I find out then I find a, a, a new strength that was there all along, I just didn't, it wasn't empowering me. Remember that little story about uh, the Apostle Paul, where he said, uh, I have this thorn in the flesh, this thing that just keeps bugging me. It's, it's a weakness. It, and we don't know if this is a physical problem or if it's uh, a demonic or we don't really know exactly what it was. But he says, this thorn in the flesh and three times I asked the Lord, take it away from me. Take it away from me. And uh, God gave him this good news, says, no, I'm not going to take it away from you because in your my power is strong in your weakness. Depends on me. And so Paul says, uh, when God says, my, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness, Paul said, then most gladly, I'll rather boast about my weaknesses. I'll admit that I'm weak. I'll admit that admit I don't know what to do. But God knows what to do. That the power of Christ may dwell in me. And therefore, I'm well content with weaknesses. For when I'm weak, weak I'm strong. That's quite a contradiction, is it? When I'm the weakest, 
I'm the strongest. Well, it's because in our weakness, it causes us, it forces us to in, lean entirely on Christ. And that's when we find real strength. Because God's spirit within us, when we confess those weaknesses, God's spirit within us empowers us and we work together with the power that the spirit provides. Now, Colossians 1.29 emphasizes this. Paul says, I labor. And the word here is I work hard. I put everything I can do. This is not the lazy person. Well, I just throw my hands up and let God. This is I work hard. I pray hard. I do all the things I need to do. I labor, striving, working up a sweat, according to his power, which works mightily within us. We call it working out what God works in. So when I'm weak, but I know I need to put effort in, but at the same time, I'm asking God and leaning on God and depending on God to empower me, I find supernatural strength. It's really one of those contradictions. When I'm the weakest, but I throw myself on God in faith and depend on his spirit, that's when I'm the strongest. And that's when the power of the spirit is most manifest in my life. So here's good news. The spirit helps us in the middle of our failings. He doesn't abandon us because of them. A little bit deeper in this passage, the Spirit helps us express the deepest yearnings of our heart towards God. Now, this passage goes on to say in Romans 8, 26, we don't know what we ought to pray for. Now, the very fact that there's an ought means there is some things we should be praying and we ought to, but we don't know what the ought is. We're kind of at a loss. It says, we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So the Spirit of God helps us express the deepest yearnings of our heart towards God. You know those times when you just, you know you need to pray, but you don't know what to pray? I experience this most often when I am uh, in a hospital visit, when someone I love and someone I'm concerned about is physically failing and a part of me cries out oh god save them but another part of me says this is not the end and if they're going to come out of this worse than they are now or have been and so i'm at a loss i don't know what to pray and so god i just I, it's, it's almost just like it's just a, a deep groan that comes out that doesn't even come out but it just I don't know what to pray. In that time, this passage says, the Spirit intercedes for us. That's amazing. So the Spirit ex helps express the deepest yearnings of our heart towards God. Now, why do we have these problems? I, I gave you one illustration, but there's a number of other reasons we have this problem. You see, we have limitations due to our human condition that keep us from praying in God's will. Now, we want to pray in God's will. We want to pray as we ought. That's what God's will is, what we ought to ask for, what we ought to do, what we ought to follow, and all those things. But sometimes we're just at a loss at what, what is the right thing. Now, the reason for this, there are three, three full reasons I want to give you. One is that our motives, uh, our motives are sinful, our motives are mixed, our motives are unknown. Uh, James 4.3 says, you ask in prayer, and you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it on your own pleasure. Wrong motives, sinful motives. Hey, I, I know you've heard this talk about, thank God for unanswered prayers. There have been times we, we've asked for things with wrong motives and we've asked for things with, with uh, just which is best for us and not necessarily best for the kingdom of God. And God just, it seems like he turns a deaf ear. Well, rightfully so. That is an answer, by the way. But sometimes we just don't know what to pray for because of this human condition and our motives are we're mixed, we're confused, we don't know what's the right thing, we don't even know, understand our own motives. But here's where the ministry of the Spirit comes in. The, the Spirit knows what really deep down is needed and what we need and what we want and expresses those things to God. Here's another limitation we have. We don't know what the Lord's planned. You know, I, I, if often I think I know what the best thing to do, but it doesn't often turn out that way. Because God had a different plan. 
And we've said things like that. Well, I, I wanted this and I thought this, but God had a different plan. And then looking back two years, three years, five years later, of course, God's plan was the best plan. Now, James continues to go on. He's talking about people with these wrong motives and, and all of these uh, limitations. In James chapter four, he says this. Come now, all you who are say, uh, today or tomorrow we'll go to such and such city and we'll spend a year there and we'll engage in business and we'll make a profit. He says, yeah, you don't know what your life's going to be like tomorrow. Tw uh, year 2020 is a testament to that, isn't it? We started in January, all, you know, all these visions of this and this, and look where we are now. We did not know the future. We did not see this coming at all. He said, instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we'll live and do this or do that. You see, at times, we don't know what the future holds. And we, we have these plans and thoughts, but our world changes immediately, as we've all experienced, suddenly, without, without prediction, without, uh, did not see that coming. And so those type of things limit us from really praying well, but we're not, we're not helpless. God's Spirit intercedes for us because the Spirit knows what the future is. God knows what the future is. Another limitation, similarly, is I don't know the future. I don't know what the Lord has planned, and I sure don't know the future. Romans 11 says this, Oh, the depths and the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we would be His counselor? see, God's got his own plans. God knows what the future is. He knows what his plans is for you and for me and for everybody. But we don't. And so those very human limitations that we have limit our praying. But our praying is not limited. It limits our understanding of our praying, but not our praying. You see, the Spirit helps express the deepest yearnings of our heart towards God. And so the blinders can come off. Even if we can't see, the Spirit sees. And then the Spirit's intercession centers us in God's will. The ought. This passage in Romans 8 goes on to say, And he who searches the heart, that's God, knows the mind of the Spirit, the Spirit who's dwelling in us. Because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with, with the will of God. He talks about these groanings but and these unuttered prayers that the Spirit prays for us to God, and it centers us, it intercedes for us according to the will of God. The Spirit of God knows the future, the Spirit of God knows what's best for us, the Spirit of God knows what's in us, and the Spirit of God expresses the right things to God. It, it, wow! If you can get that in your mind, it can revolutionize your prayer life. The Spirit inter intercession centered us in the will of God. See, the words that the Spirit expresses, this is not tongues. This is not some supernatural language that you have to learn or certain magical or, or supernatural prayer language. There are no words. Uh, that's why one translation says in wordless expressions. See, the words of the Spirit express, this is not tongue or just some verbal prayer language. They are unuttered and unheard groanings when we're at a loss for words. This is the Spirit's intercession with an inner office memo to the Trinity, a direct line to God. You remember the old AOL, you've got mail icon? Uh, if you had AOL on your computer or maybe watch the old movie, You've Got Mail, there was this little icon that popped up. Uh, it signified that a message had come through. Well, God, Spirit within you, has a direct line to God. And God has a direct line to the Spirit. And so our failings and our weaknesses and not knowing the future and all of those things end up not getting in the way. So, in like manner, the Spirit intercedes for us in words we can't even express. And God, who searches the heart, knows the mind of the Spirit and centers us in God's will. 
Oh, if you can get a hold of that, that's just great joy. It can bring great joy to you. Now here, let's just do a little reflection on that. So that's the overview of the passage. Just a little bit of reflection. Talking about praying in God's will and knowing what you are, uh, praying as you ought. There are times you don't have to say, Lord, if it's your will. You know, we often put that little caveat, God, I'd like this new job, if it's your will. God, I'd like this to happen, if it's your will. And there are times we don't know what God's purpose is, but there are times we do know what God's purpose is. And, and this passage in Romans, talking about the Spirit's intercession, isn't talking about those times. There are times that it's very clear what God's will is. God, is it your will I should steal this? No, thou shalt not steal. God, is it your will that I'm violent and murder this person? No, thou shalt not murder. God, is it according to your will that I should leave my spouse? No, thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, there are some very clear cuts. No, these are the boundaries. These are off limits. You don't even have to question. You don't have to doubt. It's in black and white. It's very clear. Now, the, the interesting thing is, God knows when we have a heart to obey him and we are obeying him. And, and then he reveals to us those things because he knows he can trust us. But there are times we don't know what God's will is. We don't know what the purpose is. It's not clear cut. It's not in God's word. So then how do we pray in God's will when his will isn't already revealed? Which way do I go? I've got three options before me. Which way do I go? What's the right thing to do? What's the right way to vote? What's the right stance to take on this matter? What's the right thing about all of the matters that we are facing today that cause our nation and, and, and our world to be so divided? We're often lost. What, what do we do? What's the right thing to do? God, show me. That's where God's Spirit intercedes for us and guides us. So how do you pray in God's will when his will isn't revealed? It's not in black and white. Let me give you some ideas. First, start praying. Don't let it limit you that you don't know what to pray to keep you from praying. You need to be praying. Get on your knees. Bow before God. Start a conversation with God. Start praying. Ephesians tells us Pray at all times. Pray without ceasing. Now, that doesn't mean we're always got our eyes closed and our heads bowed and are on our knees, but it means we maintain this spirit of contact that any time we'll, we can hear God speak to us and any time we just express to God, we just have this inner readiness to converse. Always pray. Start praying. And then don't hinder the Spirit's ministry in your heart. Remember, we've got this spirit within us to intercede with us according to the will of God and, the, and God who knows the mind of the spirit and the spirit intercedes and, and all, all that things the passage lays out. But sometimes we kind of block that. We kind of mess that communication up. And although the spirit still communicating with God, we're not hearing it. We're not, we're not benefiting from that ministry. So don't hinder the spirit's ministry in your heart. Now, two passages. Uh, Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And another parallel passage, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Don't quench the Spirit. Now, grieving the Spirit is stopping the Spirit. It's um, breaking the Spirit's heart, causing the Spirit to grieve. And quench, that's the idea of like you got a flame going and you pour water on it and stop it from happening. So really what we're talking about is two different approaches, or two different sins. The sin of omission. We're not doing what God wants us to do. When we don't do what he wants us to do, it grieves God. It, it pains God. And then we, the sins of commission, the things we do that we shouldn't do, it quenches God's spirit. So in both of those, obedience to God's Spirit, obeying God in the things he tells you to do in his word, the clear-cut will of God, that's what you need to be walking in. That keeps the Spirit's ministry from being blocked of the work that he wants to do in your heart. So start praying. Keep praying. Don't hinder the Spirit's ministry in your heart by disobedience and neglecting God. 
keep up the disciplines, keep walking the, the Christian life of faith, and then always subject your will to his will. You know, this is the heart of what it means to be a Christian. The Christian confession in Romans 10, 9 is if you'll confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You see, those who are saved are not those who go to church. Going to church doesn't save you. It's not those who read the Bible. Reading the Bible doesn't save you. It's not those, all of those things, those are things we do because we are saved, but they don't save us. If you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Jesus is Lord. He's the boss. He's the master. I'm the servant. When the master says go, I go. When the, ser- the master says stop, I stop. Do this, I do it. Don't do that, I don't do it. See, that's what it means to be obedient to the Lord. It means to surrender. I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. We used to sing in an old hymn. So always subject your will to his will. By the way, this is the essence. This is the very heart of what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. To pray in the name of Jesus is not a magical formula that we tack on the end of our prayer, in Jesus' name we pray, and therefore because we do that, God's going to automatically answer our prayer. To pray in Jesus' name is to pray in the same spirit and attitude that Jesus would pray, which was always to subject his will to the Father's will. I see this so clearly in that, on that night in the uh, Garden of Eden, or the Garden of, uh, in the Mount of Olives, praying. As he prayed there, he knew the cross was before him. And he prayed out great with great passion. Oh, God, if there's some other way, Father, if possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Ultimate submission to what God wanted. That's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. You see, my kids can sign my credit card in my name. I, I give them that authority, and they can sign my name or sign their name as a representative of my name. I give them that authority. But that does not give them authority to go take that credit card and use it on something that I would not agree with. That steps outside of the bounds of in my name as, as if what I would do. And so when we pray in the name of Jesus, we are praying like Jesus would, always subjecting our will to his. Always subject, always surrendered to him. So start praying. Keep praying. Don't hinder the Spirit's ministry in your heart by disobedience or laziness or sins you commit or omit. Always subject your will to his will. And then live your life in faith. Get up and go forward in faith with confidence that the Lord hears your prayers. This passage says that we've got this inner office memo going on between us and God. The Spirit expresses to us what we ought to pray. And the Spirit of God, or God reads the mind of the Spirit, knows the mind of the Spirit, so that we centered in God's will. Now John says it this way in 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence we have before him. So, Confidence, boldness, just sure. This is the confidence which we had before him. If we ask anything according to his will, that's the same thing as asking according to his name. If we ask him anything according to his will, remember the Spirit is interceding for us according to the will of God. So we got that going for us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Boom, there it is. He hears us. Not he might hear us and he could hear us and... Boom, he hears us. And so this is how it affects you. If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked from him. And that's why we have confidence. Remember that passage in Romans, he who searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. You can, if you're praying, if you're keeping your heart right and not blocking the Spirit's work in your life, If you're subjecting your will, God, your will, not my will, 
you can live a life of faith trusting that he will guide you. And I've, I've gone this journey long enough to know that if I start going the wrong way, God's got a lot of ways to get me back in line. And I can go forward with confidence. Even if I make a wrong mistake, God redeems that. He pulls me back. And before I make really big, severe mistakes, His Spirit pulls me back. This is a ministry of God's Spirit working in your life that you can be more than just a survivor. You can be overjoyed even in the midst of all of this stuff we face. That's God's message for you today. It's good news. So be a prayer. Pray boldly. Pray in God's will, knowing that God's Spirit intercedes. With groanings you can't even express, but it's in the will of God. Let's pray together. I want to pray for you. Thank you, God, for this amazing ministry of your spirit working in our life. Thank you, God, that even in times like this, when all of creation seems to be in turmoil in our society and we don't know what, which way to turn, thank you, God, that you've not abandoned us. You've not given up on us. You've not thrown up your hands and walked away. You've not left us to our own. Your spirit lives within us. Forgive us, Lord, where we have, we've, not, we've not prayed. Forgive us, Lord, where we have hindered your Spirit's work in our life by disobedience. Forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us. We confess our sins, and we know that you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, thank you that you live in our heart because we have confessed Jesus as our Lord and believe in our heart you raise him from the dead. So help us, Spirit of God, to walk with confidence, to walk in joy, knowing you work in our life and we can make the right decisions, we can go forward, we can walk a life that is in step with you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for letting me be with you. Let me, uh, I, I just, I hope you continue to read this passage from Romans 8. Be more than a survivor. Overcome, overpower, be, be overjoyed. L let me close with a, a blessing from Jude Chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. God's blessings on you. Bye-bye.